gradient. So the only term that needs to be computed when you, once you write it like so is this term here, which is the uh, gradient of the divergence between the desired output and the true output of the network for individual instances. We would have to compute this, this divergence term, the gradient, the gradient of the divergence for each training instance, average them all, and that's going to give you the overall gradient of the loss function. So this term is what we will compute using backpropagation. Now backpropagation, we've been through this before. Uh, for each training instance, again, going back here, we need to compute this gradient for each training instance. So for each training instance, first we're going to pass the training instance through the network. And let me, uh, and uh, I'll explain the whole process in vector form because it should be fairly simple. If my training instance is X, the input to the first, the neurons in the first layer of the network is simply going to be the weights times the input plus the bias. I've written this in vector format. So the weights in the for, for the first layer can be written as a matrix. If I want to write this out in scalar form, this is going to look like uh, ZI, which is the ith input. Actually, let me write this as Z1 comma I because we have the one over there representing the first layer is going to be uh, summation over J W uh, yeah, I comma J X J, right? So basically all of the weights for the first neuron. And we'd have a collection of these guys. This is just, this entire thing can be represented uh, as a, uh, as a uh, matrix equation, right? And then once we've computed the input to the activations in the ith layer, you can just, uh, you can operate on, on these weighted combinations using the activations of the first layer to get an output y. And then we can move forward. Again, we'd compute a weighted combination of these outputs plus a bias to get the input to the second layer, apply an activation to it to get an output to the, se the second layer and keep going forward all the way to the final layer at which point you're going to get some weighted combination of the inputs of the uh, weighted combination of the outputs of the penultimate layer of the network, to which you typically apply a softmax function, and you and you get the output of the final output of the network. Now this is a straightforward, forward pass. You're operating on the input to the network. We all know how to do this, but this is just sort of explaining the you know presenting the arithmetic, uh, in uh, in summarizing the arithmetic. Now, once we have computed the actual output of the network for the given input x, we can compute a divergence between the output of the network and, so wait, this is the, uh, this is the uh, forward pass, algorithm for the forward pass. You're going to go through the layers. For each layer, you compute the weighted combination of, input, weighted combination of the outputs from the previous layer, and then apply your activation on it, the output of the final layer is going to be the output of the network itself. So now once you've computed this, you can define, you can compute the divergence between the actual output of the network and the output that you would like to see, which in this case is going to be D up there. So this is a measure of how wrong the network is for that specific training instance. And now we can work our way backwards through the network. And basically what you're going to compute is at each point, how much would jiggling the, the uh, intermediate values in the network by a little bit change the actual error, the divergence that you finally see. So you could first compute the divergence, the, the derivative of this divergence with respect to the output of the network itself. Now this is going to be a vector, right? Because you have the derivative of a scalar divergence with respect to a vector output. And according to the, uh, and, uh, according to the way in which we defined these, uh, these derivatives, this is a gradient. So if my output is represented as a row vector, do you remember what the format of this derivative is gonna be, anybody? Would it be a row vector or a, or a column vector? So if my output is a column vector, the gradient is going to be a row vector. We defined it as a transpose 
And there was a reason we did that. We said that the, the, our definition for how much the output is going to change, delta dive, was going to be uh, times delta y, right? So if this is a row vector, this has to be a, I mean, this is a column vector, this has to be a row vector. And that's why uh, this, 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 uh, this gradient is a row vector. And now once you've computed the gradient of the row vector, you can take a step back. And you can compute the gradient of the, you can compute the derivative of the error with respect to the input to the softmax layer. And this is just your regular chain rule, right? So this is going to be the final gradient times the derivative of the output of the softmax with respect to the input of the softmax. The output of the softmax is a column vector. The input of the softmax is a column vector. What is the derivative called? Anybody remember? It is the Jacobian, right? The derivative of a vector function with respect to a vector argument is a Jacobian. So we will just multiply this derivative by this guy. Observe the direction in which the uh, multiplication happens. This, this direction is really important because now we are speaking where we are, we are dealing with vectors and matrices. You can't change orders, right? So as I move backwards, these derivatives are going to keep multiplying forwards. And so the derivative of the divergence with respect to the input to the softmax layer is going to be the derivative of the divergence with respect to y times the derivative of y with respect to z, right? That's the Jacobian. Straightforward chain rule. It's very easy to show that this is true. And it's actually there in the slides from the last class or two classes ago, right? And now the input to the softmax layer is just the weighted combination of the outputs of the n minus one layer plus the bias. So these two guys are strictly in proportion, B and Z, right? Which means that the derivative of the divergence with respect to B is simply the derivative of the divergence with respect to Z. So that's easy. Now, the derivative of the divergence with respect to this weight, it turns out, is simply going to be this guy, the output over here, times the derivative of the divergence with respect to Z. Now, uh, I won't actually go through the arithmetic, but you can see the dimensions fit, right? What is the, so let's say W is N cross M, then what is the dimension of Y? It's going to be N cross one, right? What is the dimension of Z? It's going to be M cross one. The dimension of the gradient of the divergence with respect to Z is going to be one cross M, correct? And so this term is going to be M cross M, which is exactly the dimension of W. So it's easy to check that the arithmetic works out, at least in terms of dimensions. Is anybody, right? Anytime you write out these, the, the derivatives for, for, or, of uh, functions of matrices and vectors, you can just check that one check to make sure everything is right is to just look at the dimensions. They must work out. And now we can take a step back. So the derivative of the divergence with respect to the output of this layer, again, what is the derivative of compute? It says if I jiggle this guy a little bit, how much does the divergence change? And that's really what we want to know, right? If I increase it, does the divergence increase? In which case you're going to walk back, etc. So this one, I can again use the chain rule. That's going to be the derivative of the divergence with respect to z times the derivative of z with respect to y. Right? And notice the order again. I'm going to post multiply this derivative with this guy. And what is the derivative of z with respect to y over here? What was the equation over here? If we go back, z was w times y, correct? So the derivative of z with respect to y is going to be just w, right? Straightforward. It doesn't matter that, it's, that, that these are vectors and matrices. The arithmetic just carries over straight uh, exactly as it does in the scalar case. And so you're going to have the divergence of the, di di the, the derivative of the divergence with respect to z, which is this term, times w. 
okay. And now I can take a step back and now compute my, the derivative of my divergence with respect to this guy, the input to this layer, which is simply going to be the derivative of the divergence with respect to the output times the derivative of the output with respect to the input, which again is going to be, what is that? It's a vector function of a vector argument. What is that? That is a Jacobian, once again, right? But now, if I, there's a, here I've made a small distinction in this particular example, it doesn't always hold, need to hold, between this layer and this guy. In the case of the softmax layer, if I change the, this weight, the weight that goes in to the last entry into the softmax, it is going to change the, uh, every single output. Why does that happen? There are, there's a normalization term, right? If I change one term, all the outputs are going to change. Therefore, the Jacobian is going to be, what kind of a matrix will it be? It's, it's not going to be diagonal, it's going to be full, right? Because every entry into Jacobian tells me how much changing a particular parameter changes something else. And every input changes every output, right? In this case, I'm assuming that all of the activations are disconnected. What will the divergent Jacobian matrix be like? It's going to be diagonal because if I change this weight, it has no influence on the outputs of the other guys in the network, in that layer, right? And now I can work my way back. I can now compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to the, both the weights and the biases in this layer, which is simply going to be the derivative for the, for the bias. That's simply the derivative of the divergence with respect to this guy, right? Straightforward. For the weights, what is that derivative going to be? It's the same rule as before. It's going to be this term, this y, times the derivative of the divergence with respect to z. And once again, you can check that the dimension fits. Correct? So that working, guys? Perfect. So once again, you can see that the dimension fits, right? And then I can compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to the output of this layer, which is simply going to be this derivative times the weight. Then I can compute the derivative with respect to the input, which is going to be the derivative with respect to y times the Jacobian and so on, work my way all the way backwards to the first layer and the derivatives of the weights and the biases with respect to the weights and biases are, are, are going into the first layer. So the calculus is very simple. It's just repeated application of the chain rule. Although when we try to explain it in scalar form, it ends up looking somewhat complex. If you're just willing to accept some of these uh, simple rules of calculus like the chain rule, chain rule or the fact that the multiplication is left to right, which you can verify by checking the dimensions. Then you can just see that as you walk backwards, the partial derivatives keep multiplying forwards, and so you can compute all of these derivatives, right? So this was a very simple uh, uh, procedure for back propagation. Why do we call it back propagation? First, you pass the data in, computed the error, and then you walked backwards trying to figure out how much a small change in the current intermediate value, be it you know, a variable or a parameter, would change the error. And you have to do this backwards, starting from the end, going back all the way in. So the entire backward pass, summarizing, uh, there's the recursion. You walk back and you compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to each z and then backwards with respect to each y, you can keep going back all the way. And somewhere along the way, you also compute the derivatives with respect to the weight matrices and the biases. And once you do that, you can gather them all into the overall back propagation, uh, overall uh, gradient descent algorithm. So you'd go over all of your training instances, you'd compute the average divergence with respect to both the weights and the biases. And once you've computed the average, you can just update your weights by you know, subtracting some step size times the average divergence, right? So uh, this was the whole back propagation algorithm. Calculus, it's very straightforward. Does anybody have any questions on Piazza anywhere? <laughs>
because there really shouldn't be any confusion. It's very straightforward. And it doesn't matter what kind of activations there are. It doesn't matter how the inputs combine. The arithmetic itself is fairly straightforward. So for example, within, within this uh, uh, layer or any given layer over here, if I'm multiplying things, if I'm taking square roots, cube roots, I could be computing any kind of operation. It doesn't have to be the simple functions that we have seen, seen in class so far. The basic arithmetic is still going to apply exactly as it has been presented to you, right? Okay, what are the issues with this basic approach? First, when we are using backprop, we are not, we are defining a divergence between the desired output and the true output. This divergence is a continuous valued function which penalizes greater distances more than it penalizes smaller distances. If I'm computing uh, classification error, what is the penalty? I'm either right or wrong. Classification error is not a differentiable function of anything, right? I'm either right or wrong, bang. So I can keep modifying my weights, I can keep modifying my inputs. At some point, it's just everything's going to work out, I'll have the correct classification. But during the process of modification, I have no way of knowing whether I'm getting better or whether I'm getting worse because it's a discrete step function. So we replace the classification error with this divergence, which also gives you an indication of how far away from the right you are. Now this comes at a cost. The divergence is not classification error. So which means that minimizing the divergence is not guaranteed to minimize classification error. The two are related, the two are not the same. This is, this is one of the big issues with backprop. If you treat classification error itself on the training data as what you're really trying to optimize. There was a question about, several questions about this on Piazza, just to clarify, right? Now there's a second issue which has to do with the fact that we are minimizing the loss and minimizing the loss through gradient descent. And that comes with its own set of challenges. We saw this in the last class. And that was this, right? has to do with the fact that we're using this gradient descent rule where we are multiplying the gradient by a step size. Now, the gradient, is it a scalar or a vector? For every, it's, it's either a matrix, if you're looking at the weights, or it's going to be a vector if you're looking at the biases, which means if I, if I, if I think of the entire collection of weights and biases as one giant vector, the gradient is a vector. I'm using the same, same step size for every single parameter in the network. That's what this gradient descent rule is doing, right? Now, what is the issue over here? Notice that the step size multiplies the gradient. The step size is not the size of the step you're taking. The step size times the gradient as the step size step that you're taking, right? And that's the problem. That, that's where the problem comes in. So look at this guy over here. Out here, so on the left panel, top left panel, in the first position, the gradient is, the magnitude, magnitude of the gradient is rather large, right? Because the function is steep. And so when I multiply that gradient by a step size, the step is going to be large. Then I arrive at a place where the magnitude of the gradient is somewhat less because the function has become shallower. So now when I multiply that step size, that gradient by a step size, what happens to my step? It becomes smaller. And now the magnitude is smaller still. I multiply that by a step size, it becomes smaller still. I go smoothly to a minimum, right? Now this term to the right, this is also a function. It's also a nice goal, but it's much, much steeper. So now if I'm using the same step size at the first position, the function is rather steep. So if I multi which means that the gradient is large, right? If I multiply that by a step size, what happens? I take a giant step. When I take a giant step, the giant step can actually swing me all the way out to that point to the right, where instead of going down, now I have not only gone up, I've actually gone to a place where the gradient is even larger. The thing is even steeper, right? And now I'm going to multiply that by a step size. What happens? I'm going to come back and it's going to go back up and the gradient is larger still. So here, 
this back this gradient descent rule is not a gradient descent rule at all. It's a gradient. It just you're ascending, you're walking up. It's an unstable uh, iteration, right? So now if I have a function of two variables, like in this case over here, so this is a function of both w1 and w2, and I have drawn the contour map. So the contour map, you can see that the function is much slope, much shallower along the vertical axis. It's much steeper along the horizontal axis. For the same step size along the vertical axis where it's shallower, in three steps, it's doing exactly this. It's getting to the optimum. But in the horizontal axis, in three steps, it's performing what's happening here at W2. It's swinging out. So you're not actually arriving at the solution. You're getting at the current point, correct point along one dime axis, along the other axis, it's splitting out. This is not a convergent solution. Now, uh, yeah. guys, do you mind shutting your laptops? All of you, please. So do you mind shutting your laptop? OK. Jan, please shut the laptop. Yeah. OK, thank you. So now, here is a different situation. So obviously, that step size didn't work out, right, for this guy. This step size was too large. I was going. I was blowing up. So let me say, okay, let me shrink my step size such that for the specific slope that I have here, my enough that when I multiply that slope by the step size, I'm going down the bowl. If I do that now, this guy is going to sort of come to the uh, optimum. What happens here now? The step size for this term is too small because I really shrank the multiplicative factor, now it's going to take forever to converge on this function. And so when I have a function of both variables, like in this case, although in one, along one axis dimension, it, it gets there really quickly, along the other dimension, it takes forever. So now convergence becomes really, really slow. Now I want to point out something over here. This is not a happy situation for us. And why is it not happy? Anyone? You're swinging back and forth. So anytime you're swinging back and forth, if you're looking at performing this kind of thing in a large scale uh, function over many, many parameters, it's really hard for you to know whether you're converging or diverging, right? Uh, th things are swinging back and forth. You really do not like things that swing. You like things to go monotonically and smoothly to the, to the optimum. Nevertheless, this one does work over here. It's just not a good, just not the kind of behavior that you would think of as friendly in this setting. So here's a quick recap with gradient descent if you're trying to learn a neural network. It's a function of weights and biases. And if you're using the standard gradient descent rule, a step size which is good in some, for some weights is going to be horrible for other weights. So you might find that some weights converge nicely, the other weights swing out. Or if you reduce the step size till every single weight is guaranteed to converge, some of them will take forever to converge. It's really not going to converge, right? So questions? Anyone? Pierre, no questions. Yes? Would normalizing the input uh, help with that at all? Or? So normalizing the input uh, will have, would help to some extent. We'll, and uh, I don't actually have slides on this. Uh, but I can, I can explain why. So here, it's easy to think of a It's best to explain this using a quadratic, right? So let's say I have a training instance, x. I have a times x. Let's, let's forget the bias for now. And I want this to be equal to, say, yi. So if I have a large collection of these training instances, I can write this as a times x1 through xt. And this has to be y1 through yt, right? So I can define my error as a times x1 through xt minus y1 through yt whole squared. Correct? And this, if you actually expand it out, 
actually this A should be our weights matrix, but anyway, it doesn't matter. A is what you're trying to estimate. You're going to get this term, which is x1 through xt times transpose times x1 through xt, which is the correlation matrix for the input itself. And this correlation matrix is basically the term that is the constant term in the quadratic that you're trying to minimize. And that constant term defines, this correlation matrix defines the eccentricity of your objective function. So the, the, if the correlation matrix has, uh, if the eigenvectors, if, if the condition number of this correlation matrix is, is really bad, your objective function is going to be extremely uh, skewed, broad in some directions and very narrow. So ideally you want the correlation matrix to have ID identity values along the diagonal, which means, which means uh, you know, which is to say you want your inputs to be white, yes. Interesting question from Jasra. Mm -hmm. Why does it take so long in history to find the backpropagation algorithm on neural network training? So you said that, like, this it's algorithm it's works very well and it's, like, much better than all the previous study methods. And he's asking, like, why did it take so long to find the backpropagation? Well, nobody actually... Uh, Okay, so this is the, the question is, why did it take so long to find the backpropagation algorithm? It was a big step. People were thinking of it in terms of the threshold activations forever. Going from a threshold activation to a relaxed sigmoid was the big step. Once they did that, backpropagation was quite, you know, was uh, fairly simple to figure out. And uh, so the original backpropagation paper was, in, was by Paul Verbos in 1972. And I have no idea why it took another 14 or 15 years before people put it all together and Hinton had his paper in science. But uh, the real big step was to realize that you didn't need a threshold function, that a soft version of it would do just fine. And that's actually a big step. It may seem obvious to us now, it wasn't back then. So, okay, now how can we fix this problem? The problem really arises because I'm using the same step size for every component that I'm trying to estimate, right? Ideally, what would I need? I'd need a step size which was customized to every component. What would the problem be with this? Anyone? So on the slide, you can read it out. <laughs> I keep all, anytime I ask you a question, I'm ready with the answer so you know we don't get hung. But Ah, so you have to look up. But what would the problem be if I want to have a separate step size for every parameter? Just housekeeping, I'm going to have to, yes, computationally expensive, I'm going to have to keep track of millions of different step sizes and update them and so on. So that's really not a very nice solution. Now, uh, and there's a lot of guesswork to do for each parameter. As well. Ideally, what we would like to do is to start with a common step size and somehow figure out whether to shrink the step size or adaptively figure out whether to shrink the step size or increase the step size uh, based on the behavior of the parameter. So we could do this individually in an adaptive manner. So go back here and look at this guy. This one, for two consecutive iterations, I have the weight keeps, the parameter keeps moving forward, right? This means that I'm fairly sure that the parameter, this is the correct direction for me to be going in. I can increase the step size. It's not just that, right? Uh, it's uh, uh, now, uh, look at this term over here. Across consecutive iterations, I'm moving back and forth, which means maybe my step size is too large. I'm swinging back and forth. So now I can decrease the step size. So just by keeping track of whether I'm continuously moving in one direction or swinging back and forth, I can adjust the step size for each parameter, although all of them started at the same step size, and eventually you expect to find the right step size for every single, right? This would be an ideal kind of setup. And in fact, this is what we do. So let's go to the next topic, R prop and momentum. So there are several questions about R prop. What exactly, does, let's go back here. How do I decide that the weight, remember, just looking at the weight is not enough. How do I decide that the weights are consistently changing in the same direction? What would a test be? I can, yeah, I can just look at the sign of the differences, correct? If the sign of the differences is consistent. Here, the sign of the difference between these two weights is positive. The sign of the difference between these two weights, so the 
one is greater than w0, w2 is greater than w1, so the sign stays the same, right? Whereas over here, w1 is greater than w0, but w2 is less than w1, the sign has flipped. You can just look at the signs of these changes, but you don't even need to keep track of two weights because you know you're following the gradient. You could just be looking at the sign of the gradient, and that tells you whether you should be shrinking your step size or not, correct? So that's exactly what we do in R prop, but except R prop is a kind of extreme uh, algorithm. You don't use the value of the gradient, you only use the sign. So the so idea is very simple. If the sign of the derivative with respect to any single parameter, so this rule applies individually to, uh, individually to every parameter in the network. If the sign of the gradient with respect to a parameter in the previous iteration is the same as the sign of the gradient with respect to that parameter in the current iteration, you're going to increase the step size by a factor alpha where alpha is greater than one. So basically increasing the step size, right? On the other hand, switch now, if the two signs are the same, basically the test is I multiply the two signs. If both of them are negative, it's the product is one. If both of them are positive, the product is also one. If the two signs are not the same, the product is minus one, right? So the simple test is, is the product of the sign of the gradient in the previous and current iterations uh, equal to one or not. So if it is one, then you increment the gradient by some factor. If it's minus one, you decrement the gradient by a factor, by multiplying that by a factor that's less than one. This is the basic idea of R prop. Observe over here that you're not actually using the value of the gradient itself. You start off with an initial step size, and for any, time, any, any uh, parameter where you're consistently moving in one direction, you keep multiplying that step size by some 1.1 or something. Anytime you're flipping back and forth, you decrease the step size by multiplying it by some 0.9. Now, there are all kinds of fine details about you know, whether you take a step back and do this or whether you take a step forward and do this. All of these are different variants of the basic idea of R prop. But the underlying concept is just this very simple concept, and it makes sense. Right? What is the issue here? I mean, if you were to find fault with this, what would it be? I'm throwing away information. I'm just retaining the sign of the gradient, right? But the, but the value of the gradient also carries information. And that's what led us to these momentum methods. So there were a couple of different variants that we saw in class. Now in the momentum method, if I have a, if I've taken a step in this direction and the next gradient is point, so, so uh, the, uh, ne if I, Think of it component by component, right? At each point, if I keep track of the derivatives, and let's say I, ha I have, I'm going to draw the derivative using a line, where the line represents the, the direction of the derivative, represent, the, uh, the, the arrow represents the uh, sign of the derivative, and the length of the line represents the magnitude. So if I were to do this, if I had derivatives of this kind, sequentially, right? So if I were to take a running average of these derivatives, I'm going to keep what would happen. So I'm going to sort of keep walking in the same direction because I find that all of my derivatives are consistently pointing in the same direction. And the running average can actually increase in size depending on how I set up this set up the equation, right? So I would just say that this is the equation we have. The current step size is going to be the previous step size, some beta times the previous step size, plus, forget the minus, the, min the minus sign basically says you're walking against the derivative, right? Plus the current suggestion based on the derivative, right? So if all of them are consistent, this is going to kind of build up. But it also has a nice property. So if you have a function of this kind, over here the derivative is going to be large, right? And then you take a step, and over here the derivative is going to be smaller. But then you're still consistently moving in the same direction. So when you take a running average, you would replace this guy by something larger because it's going to be the average of these two guys, right? A running average of these two guys. Now, on the other hand, let's say you have a function of uh, 
this kind. of this kind. So initially the derivative was quite small and then suddenly the derivative became steep. You increase the length. You don't really want to believe it, right? So if you take a running average, the, av the running average is actually going to end up with something that's smaller than what you have, uh, what the current derivative is. So it has a nice property, it has a nice property that it stabilizes, swings out, even if you're moving in the, in the, in the consistently moving in the correct direction. But then here's what, Let's look at the other side. So let's say if I have derivatives which swing forward and backwards, this thing should move. So let's say I have derivatives which swing forward and backwards. So one, I do this, the next is this, the next is this, the next is this. What happens? It's swinging forward and backward, but what would happen if I took an average of all of these guys? they would cancel out, right? So this property of maintaining a running average has this, nice pro has, the, has this nice behavior that when things are swinging back and forth, they cancel out. When things are moving consistently in one direction, you're going to keep going that way, right? And that is basically what momentum does. You're maintaining, uh, this is written in a nice vector form, which is very convenient because you can think of the whole thing as one giant vector operation, right? But in the directions where things are swinging, it's going to cancel stuff out. In the directions where things are consistently progressing in one direction, it's going to sort of smooth things out, and if you know, under the right conditions, it's going to elongate the step. Now, Nesterov's method and momentum and the basic momentum algorithm only differ in one basic uh, you know, uh, fact. In the momentum method, you get to some point, then you figure out whether which, which way the derivative says you must go, and then you average the derivative at that point with the step that you've already taken, right? In the Nesterov's method, you flip the order. You say, let me continue in the direction that I was walking before, and now take the derivative and move to the new direction. So you're, all you're doing is changing the order. And uh, Nesterov has this very nice proof that this latter approach is actually much more optimal than the former. So I'll stop over here with the, re with the, with the recap. Any, any questions? Yes. So I didn't say back prop would be penalizing longer distances more than shorter distances. We are speaking of gradient descent in general, right? So back prop is on, the only purpose of back prop is to compute the gradient. What you do with the gradient is, is different. And these momentum, Nestros method, all of these are how we are going to use that gradient into within a larger framework to decide which way to adjust your parameters. We're not speaking of anything, we're not speaking of layers, initial layers or latter layers. You're thinking, we're really speaking of the entire network as one giant function. What happens at individual, and, you know, at early and later layers is something we'll deal with later in class, in, in the course. But as far as we are concerned, it's just one giant function with many parameters, where every single weight and every single bias is a parameter, right? So what we are speaking, and we are performing gradient descent to learn the optimal value of every single weight and every single bias. Just put the entire neural network into with all of these weights and biases as parameters. That's what we're optimizing. It need not have been a neural network. It could have been any other function. Uh, these, these, these rules still apply, right? Momentum methods, Nesterovs, they're not special to neural networks. They're generic techniques, right? So backprop is what we use to compute gradients. But once you have the gradients, you use them within the larger gradient descent rules to find the optimal value for the parameters. They're two different things. That answer your question? Yes. If I didn't, don't feel embarrassed. I have time. The class has time, right? Yes. Is it possible for momentum or Nestor off to still get stuck in a local minima? There's no guarantee of global minima at all, right? If these are nice and convex functions, then you get to the correct fun correct, correct location faster. Uh, now, there are some kinds of functions. So this function forever here, this is not a convex function by any means. 
but it has a global minima, and these techniques will get to the local opto, you know, global minimum, right? So in such functions too, it will work. But for other functions, there are no guarantees. It's a tough question, right? Yes, but again, when you when you have when you have difficult uh, objective functions, then you can make very few statements about how close or how far away you are to the global minimum, except for some stochastic algorithms like simulated annealing. So again, at some point, it becomes goes you, you know you uh, I could say things, but my guess is as good as yours. It gets heuristic, right? All right, so here's the quick recap. I've taken a lot of time on this. Anybody, what's the time? Oh my God. So I've taken more than half the class in just this. I will continue with this class. Uh, this is going to leak over into the CNN class simply because I'd like to c complete this topic. So you're gonna have to bear with me, right? Uh, but anyway, we'd originally scheduled an extra class just to clean up the uh, issues with the training, I thought we wouldn't have to, but you know, this is the most important part of it, right? We will never revisit training. Anyway, uh, here's a recap. Neural networks are universal approximators. We must train them to approximate any function. We are trained to minimize uh, total error or average error on a training set. And we do this using empirical risk minimization, right? This is again recap from the first class on. And we use variants of gradient descent to do so, and gradients are computed using back propagation, right? And vanilla gradient descent may be too, too slow or too unstable. So better convergence can be obtained through second order methods that normalize the variation across dimensions. And adaptive or decaying learning rates can improve convergence. Methods like R-prop that decouple the dimensions can uh, improve convergence. And momentum methods which emphasize directions of steady improve, improvement and de-emphasize unstable directions also improve convergence. This is what we've seen so far. Now, one topic that I did not uh, revisit is the business with Hessians and such like. Uh, if necessary, if, we, you know, if we're going to consume all of next class on this, then I will actually revisit it. But I would rather like to use some of that time for to deal with convolutional networks, okay? Uh, yeah. Probably speaking on the situations where R prop is better than momentum or vice versa. So nobody really uses R prop anymore. I have no idea why. Uh, empirically, I've found that R prop can be as effective as momentum on my own experiments, on other kinds of functions. Uh, but uh, in the context of neural networks, I have no reason to believe one way or the other simply because I haven't seen the evidence. The nice thing about R prop is that it's trivially easy to, comp to program. So you can just test it. If anybody has any doubts, run a little test, post on Piazza. We will all be eternally thankful. I'll quote your result with your name in future editions of this class. Right. <laughs> and if you're wrong, you know, it will be on video and on the website. Okay. So, seriously, somebody run the experiment and let me know. On Piazza, someone, right? On the, on, okay. So, topics for the day, supposedly. The rest were not for the topics for the day. I don't know how they happened. Uh, now, let's get back to, first things, the th what I really, you know, if you look at the slides and the course page, the first topic says stochastic gradient descent. So finally, now that it's 10 o'clock, we can get into this very important topic. So here's how we formulate a training, right? You're given input-output pairs at a number of locations, like those dots. The bottom of the line shows the x value, the top shows the y value that you want the network to give you. The actual function may be the dotted blue line, blue curve. You're trying to estimate a network that will give you the dotted blue curve based only on the little black lines, right? So how did we do this? This was an iterative procedure. What was gradient descent really doing? You start off with an initial estimate for the parameters of the network. So you're gonna get uh, something like this uh, dotted red line. Now, here's a visualization I'd like you to think of, uh, which I will use in the next you know, few minutes. Imagine you have some kind of a shape that you want to fit, and you're given a somewhat stiff handkerchief, which is just flopping, and you're supposed to pull the handkerchief up and shape it into this bowl or whatever the shape that you really want it to be. So 
those black lines are the points at which you're going to grab the handkerchief. So if I just toss the handkerchief in any which way, sometimes it's going to be above the, above the shape I want it to be. At other locations, it's going to be below the shape. And what gradient descent does is that it grabs this shape at various locations, you know, like the standard Indian god, I'm going to sprout 1,000 arms. I'm going to grab this handkerchief at 1,000 different places. Some places I'm going to pull it up, some get plumped, some places I'm going to pull it, push it down. At each step, you know, the pull up, pull up arms will pull it up a little bit, the push down arms will push it down a little bit, and I will keep repeating this, you know. So one such it process is going to reshape it a little bit, then I'm going to do it a little more, and I'm going to do it a little more, and I'm going to do it a little more till I get the shape or some, some close approximation to the shape that I want. All I can guarantee is that it's going to be right at those black dots. We'll get to that later, right? Now, what is the issue with this? The only way I can do this is by being an Indian god. I need those thousand arms, right? I'm going to have to grab this curve at each one of those thousand places and simultaneously pull them up. Now, me, as a miserable human being with only what, two arms, can I also do this? And, you know, continuing with this visualization, you can imagine that you do, you know, there are various situations where you might actually done this, uh, you know, when you're doing paper mesh or, you know, cooking something in the kitchen, you're going to be picking up each point and you're going to be adjusting it point by point, right? So you could literally just go to the first spot and pull it up a little, then go to the next spot and pull it up a little, then go to the another next spot and push it down a little. So what are you doing? Instead of trying to pull up or push down all of the points at once, you're doing this location by location, right? And these two, as long as you're not pulling or pushing too hard, this two is eventually going to give you the shape that you want. And so, uh, what, what we would have done, the equivalent of doing this in, uh, in a gradient descent algorithm is that you will make the adjustments to your parameters after, in the, in, the, in the basic gradient descent, you're going to have to see all of your training instances before you make your adjustment. Instead, we can actually make an, make, a, make an adjustment after seeing each single training instance. And although the individual training instances will only have, uh, have, have a small effect, if you, if, you, if, you increment, if you modify things just a little bit, Overall, once you've pass, gone over all of your training instances, the net effect you have might actually be larger than if you just grabbed all of them together and pulled it up at once. Now, one standard explanation that people like to give, which I really do not like, is uh, this. Let's say you have, uh, I, probably, I don't need the board. So let's say you have a thousand training examples and you have cunningly managed to pull the same training examples each of the thousand times. So you're very clever. You know, your 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 random pro, you know the program you drew for you wrote for random selection wasn't really random. You got thousand copies of the same training instance. Now, if you were doing a batch update, and you computed the average error over all thousand training instances, you got the same result as if you computed the average training error over one training instance, right? So if you waited to process your entire training data before making the correction, as opposed to making the correction after training instance, the latter is going to be 1,000 times faster because in one pass over the training data, you would have made 1,000 corrections, right? Now you can imagine that, uh, uh, that the 1,000 instances are not all identical, but they are very similar. The same kind of logic can be expected to apply. Now keep in mind that this is hand-waving, right? This business of stochastic gradient descent, which is what we are talking about when you are incrementing after each step, each observation works regardless of whether all your, all your training instances are similar or not. So that is, you know, meant to give you an easy to consume uh, intuition more than anything else. So you get the idea of what we are doing over here. So if I were to be writing code for uh, incrementing my update after uh, or updating my parameters after every single input. Here's what the code is going to look like. I, over, I go over all of my training instances. For each training instance, I'm going to compute the, di the derivative of the divergence for that training instance with respect to all the parameters in the network. 
and then I'm just going to go ahead and apply. Uh, I'm going to have some, uh, the gradient descent rule and adjust all the parameters in my network after each single training instance. Now, there's a risk over here. So let's say these lines show my training instances and the red line shows my current curve. The blue line is what I really want it to be. So if I go left to right, I'm going to, as I go left to right, I'm going to push the curve uh, up when I get to the midway point. Then I proceed, as I proceed past the midway point, I'm going to push it back down, right? And no matter how many times I keep doing this, I'm going to keep pushing this back and forth. The whole process can become oscillatory. So if I'm going through my training instances in the same pattern over and over again, you can end up with oscillatory behaviors which won't actually give you the function that you want. So this is only guaranteed to work if you, uh, if you go through all of your training instances in random order. Sometimes you pull something from here, sometimes you pull something from there and keep adjusting all of these. So this business of adjusting after every single input is only guaranteed to work if the input order of the inputs is randomized. Now, here's another, yes. Yeah. But for the stochastic training situation, the blue line may be different for each batch. No, the blue line is the overall function that you want. But um, the gradient that we get is... It's on the slide. The example that we push forward to the neural network. So here. So... Hang on. Blue line. Patience. A few more slides. We have the answer. Okay. So here. This, uh, that's exactly what I'm addressing. Now, consider this. Unless my function is magically correctly estimated, right, and it's already perfect for every single training instance, and that's almost never going to happen. In, in nearly every real-life scenario, you're going to get some a situation such as these. Those, those dots represent your training instances. The line represents the function that best approximates all of these training instances within the, uh, within the constraints of your model, right? What do you observe? That line is wrong for every single training instance. Right? It's just correct on average. So what will happen as I keep going through the training instance? Each training, the first training instance is going to pull the red line down. The next one is going to pull it up. The third one is going to pull it down. The fourth one and the fifth are going to pull it up. It's never going to really settle to, to, to the correct value. It's always, as you point out, going to be following the correction for the latest instance. Right. So how would you fix this? Split the full sample size into smaller batches. For but it's, it's, it's still ha you're still going through the, at each point, you're correcting, to the, you're correcting for the latest data that you're seeing, right? because you're correcting online. You see something and you apply a correction immediately. Scale the correction based on some of the data points you've already seen. Yes, that's part of the answer, right? We have a parameter here. What was the magic parameter we had in, in, in gradient descent? The step size. Remember the step size? So this will work. Again, I have very conveniently given you the answer on the slide. Now, uh, this procedure will only work if the step size keeps decreasing as you go through the data. So that after, eventually, even though you may have a large gradient, you're going to scale it by a very small amount so that you're not always chasing your tail. You're adjusting to some global optimum, right? Can we put a formula to this? So here's what the overall algorithm is going to look like. If you were doing this stochastic gradient descent, you would initially randomly permute all of your training data. You're going to reorder your training data in each pass through the training data. And then for each training instance, you'd compute the gradient and update your uh, parameters. So note the two big things here. First, for each pass through the training data, you're going to randomly permute the order of your training data. Secondly, this learning rate is going to reduce with, you know, as you proceed through the data and as you and over additional passes through the data. 
So a single, now terminology, a single pass through the training data is typically called an epoch, whereas what, what you do, each individual update is just a single update. So an epoch might have thousands of updates. It's going to have as many updates as you have training instances. Now, how do you actually shrink? There you go. I'm predicting myself. Now, how exactly do you shrink this learning rate? Do we have a condition, a criterion for the learning rate that guarantees that things will converge? And of course, we have uh, experts who have worked these details out. First, you want the learning rates to sum to infinity. Why is that? The learning rate is just a sequence, right? You have a learning rate for the, after the first observation, for the next one, and the next one, and the next one. That series of learning rates, if you're changing it after every observation, the learning rate is a sequence. I can define a series, which is the sum of the sequence. I want the series to diverge. Why do I want this learning rate to diverge? In the parameter space, if my learning rate sums to infinity, it guarantees that I'm actually able to visit every point in the parameter space. If my learning rate does not sum to infinity, there are, depending on the starting point, there are entire regions of the parameter space I will not be able to visit, right? So the learning rates must up to infinity. On the other hand, I want the learning rates to keep getting smaller. Otherwise, I'm always gonna be chasing my tail, right? So the second criterion that you have is that the sum of the squares of the learning rate must be finite, which means that the learning rates are going to taper off and eventually vanish, right? So without looking at the slides, the lower half of the slides, can anybody give me a function, a series, that a sequence that actually has this property? Anyone? Anyone? I want the sequence to sum to infinity. I want the square, sum of the square of the sequence, the square, squares of the terms in the sequence to be finite. So, okay, the answer is on the slide, you may look. But, you know, 1 over k, does, what is the sum of 1 over k? That's a harmonic series, right? Is it convergent or divergent? It's divergent, right? But it's the borderline divergent. 1 over k is, you know, if it were 1 over k raised to 1.0000001, it's going to be convergent if it's right. So it's at the very borderline where it's divergent. On the other, and one over k squared, that's a convergent series, right? So this is the fastest converging series that satisfies both the requirements. Anything that converges that, that for that uh, uh, that converges, you know, that that is a power of, that is one over k raised to alpha, where alpha is greater than one, is going to convert slower. If it's going to be it's go, less, less than one, it's going to convert slower. If it's greater than one, it's not going to be able to explore the space at all, right? So these are the criteria that you have on the step size parameter to make stochastic gradient descent work. Now you can define convergence. Uh, I have some slides on convergence, but here's the summary of this, right? Uh, if you have, So forget the arithmetic. For generically, uh, for generically uh, convex functions, stochastic gradient descent has a convergence rate which is one over square root of k. Now batch update has a convergence rate which is c raised to k. So as you can see, batch updates converge much, much faster than stochastic gradient descent. But the difference lies in this magic term k. In a batch update, you're going to a single k is going to increment by one, and for k after you have passed over your entire training data once. So if you have t instances of training data, you have actually processed t instances before you increment k by one. Whereas a single pass over your training data in stochastic gradient descent is going to increment k by t. So so although if you just compare iteration to iteration, stochastic gradient descent is much, much slower than batch, ba, you know, batch updates. 
if you consider the fact that in a single epoch, you're performing many, many updates, the difference actually becomes much smaller. It doesn't mean that stochastic gradient descent is always going to be faster than batch updates. It will depend on the size of your training data. But for very large training data, stochastic gradient descent will actually be faster than batch descent, right? So, but for a small data set, here's a nice little training example that I pulled up. And there are two different things over here that uh, I'd like you, to, like you to observe. First, this red line, this is a, this is a simple k-means. The red line shows you how the k-means algorithm converges if you use stochastic gradient descent. The green line shows you how it converges if you use batch updates. And observe that batch updates converge much faster into a much better result in this particular case. But there's something else that's happening. There are these little vertical lines. Can you guess what those vertical lines are? These are the error bars. If I ran this experiment many, many times, you know, that is the, the actual value of the loss in this iteration lay somewhere between here and here, right? So this is just the average result plotted over many runs of the experiment. And what do you observe? In addition to the fact that SGD might be slower, there's a second term that's happening over here, which is? Say it aloud, please. The variance is much larger for the stochastic gradient descent than it is for the batch updates, right? And 10, 11, I have nine minutes. Okay, so let's try to understand this result. Now recall what we are really doing is we have the expected value of the divergence between the function represented by the neural network and the actual function that you want. So the actual function that you want might be some g of x. The function, the neural network is f of x and w, right? I can define a divergence between these two at every value of x, and I'm taking the expectation of this divergence. What I really want to do is to find the w that minimizes this expectation. This is the real objective that we are trying to perform. We are trying to minimize the average error over the entire input space, not just at the training and training points, but over the entire input space. This is our real objective. But what we are really doing is we are defining an average error over all of our training instances, right? And when we define our average error over all of our training instances, I have uh, the error That's me speaking to myself? Yes, okay. So I have an error which is defined as one over n, summation over i, so divergence of uh, f of xi, d of xi, right? If I take an expectation on both sides, this is simply going to be by linearity, 1 over n, summation over i, expectation of the divergence, correct? Which is going to be 1 over n times n times the expectation. These cancel out. So the expected value of this error, the, the empirical error, is exactly the same as the expected divergence that we are trying to minimize. Now, does this mean that uh, so what exactly do I mean by making this statement? What I mean is that if I, if, if I were to have a collection of you know, n training instances, if I, uh, if I selected n training instances at random and computed the average error, and I kept repeating this, before, this many times, in each experiment I select n training instance, compute the average error. The average of all of those averages is going to be the actual expected error. Now, I'll show you some figures which kind of explain this. Now, but there's something else that happens over here. So, we see that the expectation of the error is going to be the expectation of the divergence, and the expectation of the divergence is what we really want to minimize. So, we are fine. What about the variance of this error? What, are the, what is the variance of this error going to be? Anyone? Assuming that the training instances are all independent, what is the variance of the error going to be? So 
here. What is the variance of the sum of, a, of n independent random variables? No, the variance is not Gaussian. What is the variance of the sum of n independent random variables? It's going to be it's going to be the sum of the variances, right? So if you actually work this out in this case, uh, or it's this is going to be uh, you you'd get a when you actually work this out, you will find that the uh, variance is going to be one over n. I'll, I'll, I'll leave out the, you, you must have encountered this in your probability courses any number of times, right? If I'm taking the average of many values, the variance of this average is going to be 1 over n times the variance of an individual instance, correct? So when I'm doing batch update, the variance is 1 over n, the variance of, my, uh, of, my, of, the, of the loss function that I'm computing is going to be 1 over n times the variance of the divergences, right? When I'm performing stochastic gradient descent, I'm looking at one instance at a time, correct? So I'm only minimizing, an, uh, at, within each iteration, I'm only minimizing this individual divergence. The expected value of that is still just the expected value of the divergence. So, even, so the loss function, the, the loss function that I'm using for stochastic gradient descent is actually an unbiased estimate of the expected error. But then the variance is going to be, you know, the loss is just the divergence of a single, single sample, right? So the variance is going to be the variance of the divergence itself. If I compare this to what happens when I'm using, when I'm, when I'm performing batch updates, the variance of the loss, yes. So you are using all of the training instances and averaging out the divergence that you're getting from all of the training instances. So the question, well, I suppose. Yeah, they, they can see the, the chat. Okay, fine, good. So uh, here. So what this means is that when you're performing stochastic gradient descent, the variance of the loss function is much greater, is n times as much as the variance of the loss function when you're performing batch descent. Now let's try to get a feel for this using figures, right? So let's say the blue curve is what I'm currently, I've currently got, is the function that I'm trying to estimate. The red curve is what I currently have as the output of my network. So the colored areas of the curve, uh, between the two curves, represent the area that I'm trying to minimize when I'm trying to optimize my function, right? This area is what I would like to minimize. The blue, re the blue uh, patches are where the blue curve is higher than the red curve. The red patches are where the red curve is higher than the blue curve. But it's going to be the total area that I'm trying to minimize. Now, when I'm training, I don't have the entire curve. I just have a few samples. So I might have these one, two, three, four, five, six samples. So for each of these samples, I have some error, which is shown by the blue or the red lines, right? And what I will do is to average out the squared value, squared magnitudes of these lines. And I'm going to be approximating the sh shaded area with the average length of these lines, right? And if I minimize the average length of these lines, my hope is that this also minimizes the shaded area. This is basically what empirical risk minimization is doing. It's approximating that the, the area of the, the, the colored regions of this figure with the average length of these of, of the uh, colored lines that you have in the plot, right? Now, what is the problem over here? If I change the positions of my samples, the average length of these lines changes, depending on where I place those samples, right? So if I'm going to have four lines, if I randomly choose them, depending on where I choose those four points, I'm going to get a different estimate for the error. When I begin minimizing it, I'm going to end up with a different solution, right? So when I have many more samples, this variation across different draws is going to be lesser because I expect to populate the whole thing more. If I have just one sample, here's what you're going to get. Suppose that one sample happens to be at, happens to be at that crossover point. There is no correction to be made, right? So depending on where I choose my sample, I can come up with different conclusions. So if I have my sample over here, 
I decide that there's no correction to be made. If I, have, if I have my sample over here, I decide that the entire curve has to be pushed up. If I have my sample here, I decide that the entire curve has to be pushed down. And so when you have just one sample, depending on the position of the sample, the variance in the loss function can be enormous. And that is basically what we are observing over here. So these red lines uh, show that the variance between the different runs is quite large for stochastic gradient descent, much larger than for batch descent, right? So here's what we have. SGD uses the gradient from only one sample at a time, but it has consistently high variance. At the same time, it converges faster. It may not converge to the same answer as batch descent, but it converges faster to than batch descent does. So can we come up with something in between which is neither, which has the uh, good behavior of SGD in that you get many more updates, so you might, you might converge faster while having lower variance. And that is what is what we will call the mini batch update. Now go back to the handkerchief uh, uh, simile. Instead of sprouting a thousand arms and trying to grab the entire handkerchief all at once, or just picking the handkerchief one point at a time, what if I grabbed it at four or five locations at a time? Each time I'm looking, at, I'm, I'm grabbing a different set of four or five locations. So instead of using all of my training samples, I'm going to use a small number of training samples within each pass, except that within each step, I'll be choosing a different set of training samples. So the update rule is going to look something like this. I would, again, remember we have to randomize the process, right? So first you'd randomly permute your inputs, then you would actually compute the average gradient over a small number of inputs, a small, that this is what we call a mini batch, and then update your parameters, then grab another set of B inputs, find the average gradient. Yes, what's the time? Uh, okay, so I'll stop right here, right? And repeat this until error has converged. And I will stop right here quite abruptly. We'll pick up from right here in the next class, right? If you have questions, post on Piazza. We've run out of time. Thank you.